Word-Rooted Prayer and Worship, Keeping Your Heart Close to the Flame. This is part 14, and we're continuing from last Sunday night, Why Wholeheartedness in Worship Might Not Be Enough. I softened it a bit from isn't enough. 2 Samuel 6, 1 to 23. I read this, and I'm going to reread it because the points come out of this story, and you kind of need the story, the drift of the story. David again gathered all the chosen men of Israel, 30,000, and David rose and went with all the people who were with him to Baal Judah to bring up from there the ark of God, which is called by the name of the Lord of hosts, who sits enthroned on the cherubim. And they carried the ark of God on a new cart, brought it out of the house of Abinadab, which was on the hill, and Uzzah and Ahio, the sons of Abinadab, were driving the new cart with the ark of God, and Ahio went before the ark. David and all the house of Israel were making merry before the Lord. They're worshiping, they're celebrating with songs and lyres and harps, tambourines, castanets, cymbals. Makes you think it's going to be drums in heaven almost, doesn't it? Six. When they came to the threshing floor of Nacon, Uzzah put out his hand to the ark of God and took hold of it, for the oxen stumbled. And the anger of the Lord was kindled against Uzzah, and God struck him down there because of his error. And he died beside the ark of God. And David was angry because the Lord had burst forth against Uzzah. And that place is called Perez Uzzah or break, breach with Uzzah to this day. David was afraid of the Lord that day. And he said, how can the ark of the Lord come to me? So David was not willing to take the ark of the Lord to the city of David. But David took it outside to the house of Obed-Edom, the Gittite. And the ark of the Lord remained in the house of Obed-Edom, the Gittite, three months. And the Lord blessed Obed-Edom and all his household. And it was told to King David, the Lord has blessed the house of Obed-Edom and all that belongs to him because of the ark of God. So David went and brought up the ark of God from the house of Obed-Edom to the city of David with rejoicing. And when those who bore the ark of the Lord had gone six steps, he sacrificed an ox and a fattened animal. And David danced before the Lord with all his might, and David was wearing a linen ephod. So David and all the house of Israel brought the ark of the Lord with shouting and with the sound of the horn. And the ark of the Lord came to the city of David. Michael, the daughter of Saul, looked out of the window and saw King David leaping and dancing before the Lord. And she despised, that's a strong word, despised him in her heart. 17. And they brought in the ark of the Lord and set it in its place inside the tent that David had pitched for it. And David offered burnt offerings and peace offerings before the Lord. When David had finished offering the burnt offerings and the peace offerings, he blessed the people in the name of the Lord of hosts, distributed among all the people, the whole multitude of Israel, both men and women, coffee, tea, donuts, and a cake and raisins to each one. Then all the people departed, each to his house. But David returned to bless his household, but Michael the daughter of Saul came out to meet David and said, how the king of Israel honored himself today, uncovering himself today before his eyes of his servants, female servants. And one of the vulgar fellows shamelessly uncovers himself. It's not that he was like indecently exposed, but his royal robes, he wasn't kingly. 21. And David said to Michael, it was before the Lord. And then there's this little bit of rubbing salt in who chose me above your father and above all his house to appoint me prince over Israel, the people of the Lord. And I will make merry before the Lord and I will make myself more contemptible than this. And I will be blessed in your eyes, but by the female, I'll be abased in your eyes, sorry, but by my female servants of whom you have spoken by them, I shall be held in honor. And Michael, the daughter of Saul, had no child to the day of her death. You're meant to see, and we're going to look at it, this contrast between the ark of the Lord being such a trouble to Uzzah, who reaches out to steady it, and the ark of the Lord being such a blessing, blessing to the Gittite, the house of Obed-Edom. Last week, we began our study of this striking passage. I'm not going to go over the same background to these events that I covered there. That's online. Uh, the first point and perhaps the central point of both teachings was a passion for worship without an accompanying passion for knowledge is a dangerous thing. 
Just ask Uzzah. He reaches out to steady the ark as the oxen stumble, keep the cart from falling into the mud. He did it to protect the glory of God. He did it because he loved God and he loved that ark. That's why he reached out to steady it. Everything looks right about what he's doing. And God kills him. I mean, I could just say he died, but we all know what the passage says. So why? Was he not sincere in wanting to protect the ark and keep it from falling? He was. He was absolutely sincere. But he was still disobedient. The ark was to be carried on the shoulders. It was never, God very specifically said, not on a cart, carried. Either David and company forgot, possible, or hadn't taken the time to learn in the first place how the ark of the Lord was to come to Israel. The Philistines had captured the ark. They sent it back to Israel on a cart. These people are just continuing with what they saw. This is what everybody was doing. Must be right. But it was terribly wrong. Sincerity, sincerity without a knowledge of God's will and ways, sincerity is, has no currency with God. Just sincerity has no currency. Now I want to do two more lessons. So that's kind of a quick review of last week. Two more lessons. So this is point number two, counting last week. Notice David's response to God's purifying presence. His reaction is exactly what mine would have been. It's in verse 9 of 2 Samuel 6. And David was afraid of the Lord that day. And he said, how can the ark of the Lord come to me? That was the visible symbol of God's presence. The mercy seat on top, the commandments, some manna inside the ark, although that varies with different descriptions, but basically that's, that's what it was, this picture of God's presence. And after Uzzah is struck dead, David, first it says he's angry with God. And then David says, I don't, I don't, I don't want this thing. Get this thing out of here. This is nothing but trouble. It, God is too holy to be with someone like me. You ever felt that? God is too holy to be with someone like me. If God is anything even close to this holy and fearful, how can I ever stand before him? How can this kind of God not destroy everything about a person like Don Horbin? It's a good question. Make no mistake about it, David would never, David would never have had anything to do with the ark of the Lord ever again, except God does something. God gives David a little lesson. God demonstrates something while David banishes the ark, get it out of here. And it goes to the house of Obed-Edom for 90 days. It's in verses 10 and 11. So David was not willing to take the ark of the Lord into the city of David. Not, not here. No. David took it aside. That's an interesting, aside, out of the way. To the house of Obed-Edom the Gittite. And the ark of the Lord remained in the house of Obed-Edom the Gittite three months, 90 days. And the Lord blessed Obed-Edom and all his household. So God's trying to teach David something. God knows David is watching the household of Obed-Edom. God knows that David thinks this ark is just a dangerous piece of business and doesn't want anything to do with it. That's why he sends it aside. But as he watches the household there for three months, the ark brings nothing but blessing. God is a great teacher. So David, he keeps his eye on the ark from a distance. 
and he sees that at Obed Edom's house, nobody's dropping dead from the ark. Everything was great. Everything was multiplied. Everything was blessed. Today's world, his stocks and bonds were just busting at the seams. Verse 12, and it was told King David, look, the Lord has blessed the household of Obed-Edom and all that belongs to him because of the ark of God. Okay, so now David went and brought up the ark of God from the house of Obed-Edom to the city of David with rejoicing. So even a great man like King David had to learn the same lesson that I have to learn, the same lesson that you have to learn. The problem wasn't the ark. It never was the problem. The problem wasn't with God. The problem was they weren't obeying the Lord in the way they were transporting the ark. God had given instructions. They were sincere. They had no knowledge, no understanding, and no obedience. And that was the problem. The problem wasn't the ark. It's one of the most important aspects of your ongoing growth, walking in the spirit, growing in discipleship. There's a lesson that's bound up in this incident that more than anything else will have a big impact shaping your walk with God. How do you hear God's call to holiness? What meaning does that phrase the fear of the Lord have in your life. I'm, I want to just point out, I think there are two responses to the holiness of God that are spiritually deadly. Two responses to the holiness of God that are deadly. A, you can think God doesn't take sin any more seriously than we do. So, so you can, this is a danger. You can play up, sing about God's love, God's faithfulness, God's grace, God's mercy. All of which is true and praiseworthy. But you can do it to the extent that without anybody ever saying the words, he's almost morally indifferent to all but, you know, the most perverse, blatant sins. My own opinion, I can't show you chapter and verse. My own opinion is one of the reasons God allows all of us to be mistreated at some time or another in our Christian walk, even right in the church. The reason he allows us to be mistreated is without feeling mistreatment personally, we lose the sense of what it feels like to be sinned against. Only being mistreated, only being sinned against personally gives me any feeling at all about what God feels when I sin. Because let's face it, most of the time when we sin, when we disobey, we might feel a guilty conscience, we might feel convicted, it leads us to repentance, that's all good. But we have very little sense of, well, how does God feel about my wickedness? And how would I ever, how would I ever learn what God feels like when he's sinned against. And so here's what happens. God lets me be sinned against, really sinned against. And, I, and, and it hurts. It can be heartbreaking. Someone you trusted, someone you love, sins against you. Not just, you know, takes your cornflakes in the morning. I mean, really wrongs you. Why does God let us go through that? I think one of the, just one of the reasons, beside my own spiritual growth is, shows me this is how God, imagine how many people there are on planet Earth. What, eight? Are we eight billion yet? It's, it's in that ballpark. All of whom God created, in a world he created. And most of them have no time, no interest in God. What, what does God feel? when he looks at that situation. So that, I think, is the first thing. 
The first mistake, you can let God's holiness, you can magnify his love and grace and mercy and come to the place where you don't think he cares about sin any more than we do. That's the first mistake. God allows the pain of sin to be felt by each of us to teach us what sin feels like on the receiving end. It's part of our spiritual training. It's deadly, deadly not to care enough about our sins against God because without holiness, no one will see the Lord. But there's another terrible mistake we can make. B, you can let God's holiness drive you from his presence and go underground in condemnation. David almost makes that mistake. How shall the ark of the Lord come to me? How can the ark of the Lord come here? Get, get, no. God's presence? Oof. I don't want anything to do with it. There might even be people here tonight. It's not a big crowd. And you're thinking, boy, Don, if God is even half as strict as he looks in this account, I don't, I, don't, I don't think I can even approach him. You should see the mess of my life. That leads us to the next thing. Why does God bless Obed-Edom so much? Why did he make the blessing at the house of Obed-Edom so pronounced, so visible that David could hear about it? It was gaining reputation. Without social media, everybody was hearing about how God was blessing the household of Obed-Edom. And there's only one answer to that question. Why does God do it? He wants to show David that he was a good God, that his mercy and his blessing were bound up in his presence. He was enticing David back by what he was doing at the household of Obed-Edom. And so there's two things here. And if you don't hold them together, you'll always go wrong. Yes, God is holy. Yes, sincerity isn't enough. You must approach him with knowledge, with obedience, with understanding. But the reason for all of that is not to repel people, but to transform people, to grow people. Let me read you an interesting text. This isn't in your notes, and I was just, this is like 25 after 5. Let me read you some interesting verses. These are from Isaiah chapter 8. God's going to be pronouncing judgment. And Isaiah's prophesying. The people are spreading all sorts of different rumors. It's not what Isaiah says. There's other things going on here. And God's going to tell Isaiah to tell the people, don't listen to them. Listen to me. But listen to the way this is worded. I'm just going to read it to you. For the Lord spoke thus to me, Isaiah says, the Lord spoke thus to me with his strong hand upon me, and he warned me not to walk in the way of this people, saying, do not call conspiracy all that this people calls conspiracy. And do not fear what they fear, nor be in dread. Okay. But the Lord of hosts, him shall you honor as holy. Listen to this. Let him be your fear. Let him be your dread. That doesn't sound very nice. Let him be your fear. Let him be your dread. And he will become your sanctuary. Now, what is being said there? Does God want everybody, let, let God be your dread. Does God want everybody going, oh, it's God. Ah. Is that what he wants? Is that what the fear of the Lord is all about? And it's not. Here's what this passage is saying, and it's exactly the point I'm trying to make, linking together the holiness of God and the love of God and the grace of God. The, the ark Uzzah, struck dead for disobeying the Lord. The wrath of God, the holiness of God, and God blessing the house of Obed-Edom with the ark. Same ark. 
you have to obey and understand. And when you walk before the Lord properly, there's blessing and mercy. And both those things have to be put together. Now, here's the way it works in Isaiah. What he's saying is, people have all sorts of views on everything. I'm, I'm, I'm paraphrasing. Isaiah, people have all sorts of views on everything. They're not my views. If you're not careful, people like we are, you can start to worry more about what people think and what people say. You can fear, you can fear them, I, I won't be accepted. I won't fit into that university class. And if you fear them, then you, you will never secure your life. You're going to be bound by their views, their ideas. The culture around you has different ideas about all sorts of things. Are you going to, is that, is that where you want to fit in? Or he says, God says, let God will be your dread. In other words, the thing I fear most isn't displeasing Chris. The thing I fear most is displeasing God. I am terrified about displeasing God. I never want to try and secure my life in anything but God. And then, if you'll do that, if you'll do that, he says, I'll be your sanctuary. You've got something of a place of rest, strength, security. But you won't get there by sentimentalizing God. Let him be your fear. Let him be your dread. Displeasing God is my dread more than displeasing anyone else. You can't help but find safety and sanctuary if that's your view. Do you get what I'm saying? Everybody get what I'm saying? I wish I could get everybody under 20. Boy, what a time to learn it. Let God be your dread and you won't fear anything else. It's a wonderful text from Isaiah. All right, I took a little too much time with that. Yes, God is holy. Yes, he must be, must be approached on his terms. Sincerity is not enough. Knowledge, understanding, obedience. And the reason he wants you there is Isaiah to be your sanctuary. B, the ark at Obed-Edom to bless your life and bless your house. That's what happens. That's what happens. It's even why this Old Testament picture of the presence of God, the ark, it's why it's put together the way it is. The context, contents were chosen by God so carefully. The ark that the people were dancing and singing around was an ark full of the commandments of God. They were put at the very center of God's presence among the people. You have to live by this. It's not optional. But along with the commandments, there are samples of manna. This picture of God's provision for all their wandering in the wilderness. The same God who commands obedience is the God who provides provision. And on top, on top, the mercy seat. I don't keep the commandments all the time. But I don't need to just go through life condemned. There's pardon, there's grace. This is, this is the picture, the whole picture of God. You, can, you can't have the ark. You can't have the ark with just the mercy seat and not the commandments inside. That's just sentiment. You can't have the ark with just the commandments and no sentiment on, on no, no mercy seat on the top. That's just condemnation. This whole picture of God, the one we're studying with the ark, it has to be kept all together. Point number three, jumping ahead a wee bit. Learn from God's wrath and move ahead in his mercy. I get it in 2 Samuel 6, 12, and 13. And it was told King David, the Lord has, the Lord has blessed the household of Obed-Edom and all that belongs to him because of the ark of God. 
And so David went and brought up the ark of God from the house of Obed-Edom to the city of David with rejoicing. And when those who bore the ark of the Lord had gone six steps, he sacrificed an ox and fattened animal. I made the point a few weeks ago that many commentaries feel that what that's saying is every six steps carrying this ark of the Lord. So it's like one, two, three, four, five, six. There's a big throng of people. Everybody stops. Sacrifice is offered. One, two, three, four, five, six. Everybody stops. Sacrifice is offered. I mean, it, it, it takes a long time to get somewhere like that. It's, it's quite a procession. Notice that phrase in verse 13, those who bore the ark, now it's obedience. Nobody's dying. David had learned from God's word, and now he took the time to obey the instruction of the Lord, even in worship. The ark was a source of joy. Everybody's dancing around it. Everybody's celebrating. It was a source of blessing. So David, he first he's angry, he fears, then he learns, then he repents, then he moves on, and I'll tell you how he moved. Every six steps, sacrifices offered and all of those sacrifices are pictures of the shed blood of Jesus. And here's the lesson for everyone in this room. You have to keep your eyes on Jesus, move ahead in his mercy and grace. You never move very far without looking to Jesus again. It's looking to Jesus, the whole procession, looking to Jesus, the whole journey. The word will keep you enlightened. The blood of Jesus will keep you clean. Mercy without a commitment to keep the word is a sentimental self-deception. The word without constant access to mercy through the blood of Jesus is a condemning hammer. The commandments inside, hear this. The commandments inside the ark, the mercy seat on top of the ark. And Satan is happy to have you have either one as long as it's without the other. Satan is happy to have you have either one as long as it's without the other. I constantly need, constantly need the correction and the instruction of the word along with the application of fresh mercy in my life. Those two things together. Wholeheartedness is not enough. Sincerity is not enough. The instruction of the word and the grace of God's mercy. So do worship with all your might. Don't despise passion and worship. Do you know what it leads to? Don't despise passion and worship. Here's what it leads to. Michael is barren the rest of her life. There's another kind of barrenness that goes beyond physical barrenness. If you, to, to despise worship is to cut your life off from everything that brings fertility in your walk with Jesus, growth, fruitfulness. I just think there's so much to learn in that, in that really strange passage of scripture. Let's pray. different ways of praying around a sermon. You can pray at the beginning for your direction and grace. Sometimes we do it that way. Now we pause and pray, Lord Jesus, that you'll take the truth we've been listening to and you'll seal it into our hearts. That you'll take it and like the loaves and fishes, you'll, you'll multiply its effectiveness. We, we need both the truth of your word and we need the mercy seat. But our own ways are never enough. And so grow us deep, I pray. Passionate and yet deep. That has to be the best combination for our lives. And in Jesus' name we ask it. 
and may your Holy Spirit grant it. Everyone said, Amen.